if we do not reform our system, even if we provide all the teaching and learning materials, the outcome will still be poor. Right. Mm. <laughs> and, and the insightful thing was about the fact that we have so many leakages. So, so you, we all hear of the fact that rising tide lift all boats, right? If your boat was leaking before the tide came, it's not going to lift you. Mm. It will sink you when the tide comes. So we have a leaking boat. And unless we fix that boat, no matter what you do, you are not going to get the learning outcomes. And, and so I want the issues I'm going to focus on talk about as we are doing in terms of setting up a national assessment program. Because you see, when we talk about teacher absenteeism, and people are spending money, they are fixated on it, they are concerned. It's a symptom of a problem. It's just a symptom. It's not a problem in itself. You see, if that head teacher at that school was held accountable for performance and can in fact lose his job if his students don't do well, do you think he will allow a teacher to be absent so that he loses his job? No. But how do you expect that headmaster to do well when you did not train him or her to become a head teacher or headmaster. So you have a capacity issue. I walk into schools where you talk to a headmaster who is working hard and doesn't know his performance data. Even for senior high schools. I went to my own school, famous Yacha Pramso Senior High School. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's the most famous school in the country now. <laughs> so, so I walk into the school, a big ceremony, headmaster about to retire. And people are telling me, don't allow him to extend his, uh, his time here. He's the worst headmaster we've ever had. But I go to every senior high school with my data in my pocket. So I pulled out my uh, phone, look at the data for Yacho Pramsi Senior High School. The headmaster went to the school, and the A1 to C6, that is the, the number, the percentage of students who move out to tertiary from the school, when he went there, it was 12.5%. Some of you are saying, yeah, 12.5% better than most schools because some schools in Accra have 4%. That is out of every 100 youth who spend their time at the school. For three years, only four are able to move on to tertiary in schools in Accra. So Jasper Prams had 12.5 when this man went there. The next year he went to 18.5. When he was leaving, it was 41%. But the bad news is that he didn't know. He himself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so. People right. are saying that he's the worst headmaster, but the guy is the best headmaster they've ever had. Okay, so, so, so Dr. Edichum, I'm hearing a lot of ideas around the foundation, the systemic um, underpinnings of how we, how we structure education in the country. I'm curious to see how the manifesto itself reflected those changes so that we can score you better, because you were voted into power based on a document. Uh, but we were joined whilst you were speaking by uh, one of our panelists. He is lawyer and vice president of policy, in charge of policy at Imani Africa, senior consultant, Bentel Consultant Limited, Kofi Bentel. Sir Bentel, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great. Um, I thought I heard someone clapping. We, we are moving on. We are moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what we'll do is that um, we all gave our expectations of the NPP when they were entering power. Unfortunately, you were late. Um, I know for very good reason. Yes. Um, so what we'll do is take us into the next leg. The big conversation that we'll start with for the next 20 or so minutes will be on free SHS. So we'll simply discuss free SHS for about 20 minutes, and then we'll move to other aspects of the education policy. Uh, your opening comments on that. We have seen hundreds of thousands of students go to school. We have seen the implementation of a double-track system. Has this been done well? Thank you. Um, it's a scorecard, so the question is, have they done what they said they will do? And on that, I don't think they have. Um, the other issue is that we, Minister just said we didn't have an education system. We did. It produced me, it produced Kofi Annan, it produced many great people. But we did not maintain it for decades, and it ran down. In my father's time, people came from a village school, a Saito school, straight into Achimota, and went on to do great things. Today, it can't happen. So we did have a system. We didn't maintain it. We ran it down. Now it's not producing people just like what he's saying. People go through school for six years, and they can't speak a sentence in English. Now what we needed to do was to fix that system. Unfortunately, they came in with free SHS, and it's taking over everything. It's as if we didn't have problems with our education. Every 
everybody is talking about free SHS because really that's the front burner issue. So if you ask me, that is part of the problem. The fact that we've had this heavy duty issue that seems to be papering over everything as if we didn't have any other uh, problem the, in education. The media publicizer and that's our fault? Well, you set the tone. <laughs> So, yeah, so if you ask me, I was going to say yes. that because yes. um, if 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 yeah. I took a census and and not in defence to sound defensive or anything, but if I took a census of ten people, ask them what was what were three promises that you heard from the MPP going into government, based upon which you made your decision to vote, one D one F, three SHS, and one other. So yeah. it's only fair that we we start this conversation on that. Yeah. So. I'm saying this because we will end up talking free SHS, but really what I'm trying to say is that we have other issues in education. Free SHS is a new invention, all right? So for me, my scorecard or my rating is what have they done about the problems that existed in education before free SHS became an issue, and then what have they done over their own free SHS promise? Oh, go ahead. Um, with with so I'll give you three minutes, one minute on your general comments, since that's the route you want to go. And you take the next two on free SHS specifically. Right. Um, in our own work, part of the major problem with education was quality. And quality two ways. There were too few schools producing good quality. Many of them were private, especially in the preschool area. And then in the secondary school area, too few schools producing quality output, most of them in the public school area, and the spaces that were limited. And then you had grade C, D schools with spaces unfilled, and they were not producing anything. What you needed to do was to balance over these spaces. Now, that problem, I'm not too sure what has been done with it, because multi-track has come to change all of that. Then you had a situation where, indeed, you did not have enough funding in education for all kinds of reasons, including the fact that we didn't have enough money. But even with the funding you had in education, a lot of it was going waste and was not being well used. We were hoping that there will be a change in that kind of arrangement. A central issue to that was the management of schools. Schools were being centrally managed from Accra. And everywhere, including where the Deputy Minister um, has come from in the States. Local ownership is important. The school boards are important. The headmasters have real power. A headmaster today cannot fire a non-performing teacher. The teacher can come to school drunk and not do anything. He can't. And the community has no say. Okay, so you had that problem. In our view, over many years of research, we think that is the single most important problem in our education system. The responsibility structure is said that it does not encourage performance. Now, I don't think much, if anything, has been done about these things that I've spoken about. Okay, on free SHS, the promise was made. You are aware that Imani was more or less the main intellectual you know, resistance to that, not because we didn't like free education, but because we worried about intentions against implementation. Um, to make a long story short, First, we said nobody has asked that their kids' school fees be paid. Nobody asked for it. It was a political promise. Why that is important is that you always have choices in terms of what you want to use money for. And the politicians choose to do this. Now, after choosing to do it, what we said was that the intention is good, but we don't see practically a plan that can implement it successfully. The first thing we pointed out, and I'm talking years ago, was that even their analysis of how much it will cost was wrong. We proved it. To their credit, they accepted that point, and there was a lot of, you know, um, kind shifting of around. shifting around, and they kind of got those things right. But we have been proving right now. Then you have the problem with the real strategy, and one of the things we said about the strategy was that immediately you make it free, you are going to have a big, you know, influx of people, and I'm not sure all of them will not want to go to grade A schools. So you needed to do something with space, and so we had you know, a lot of things to say about different things. And each time we were told there's a thinking around it, there's a planning around it, and then there'll be, you know, a solution for all these problems. Over time, we have come to see a number of things. One, there are people even within this government saying that the means testing we've been talking about, which was said to be more or, more or less impossible or unfair, needs to be done. Number two, we've seen double track come in, and one of the reasons that we were told was that they did not foresee 
that there will be so much, you know, in terms of people wanting to go to SHS. It's a very easy thing to foresee. If you want to know who is going to go into SHS next year, those people are in JHS 3 this year. If you want to know those who are going to SHS next two years, they are JHS 2 right now. And we do have a document where we predicted all these things. So saying you did not foresee it was a bit difficult for us to understand. Now you have a situation where there is complaint about the funding. Mm. Look, I've said before that political will is important. And clearly, this government has it. They are determined to find the means to you know, fund this thing because there's no way they will let it fail. But at what cost? OK. At what cost? Mm. So all these things still remain. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't think we have come through free SHS with clarity enough about the future of free SHS to give us confidence that this program is even on course. Right. Let me switch now to uh, Prof. Korte. I'll take all the concerns and come to you, Dr. Edujo. I know that some of them need to be addressed immediately, but I'll, I'll crave your indulgence. Um, Prof. Korte, so in your opening remarks, you said you, you also have challenges with free SHS implementation. Yes, sir, and to reemphasize my point, I said I support the policy. Yeah of getting everybody to school. Um, that there's no two ways about that. Um, but then, quickly, I think I agree with uh, uh, Kofi that we had systems um, which worked, which produced some of us. Um, I went to one of the best schools in the UK, Warwick and Manchester, and I competed with all the people out there. And I believe our young ones here can equally compete when they step out there. So um, we haven't maintained the systems, but we still have something that is good, and let's be proud of it. Implementation, I had issues. One is the funding. I, I don't think the current system is sustainable. The government can struggle and struggle to defend it, but from where I sit, I don't see this sustainable. And I've offered some suggestions. Why not target means testing? We, sometimes we throw our hands in the air, uh, we, cannot, we cannot identify people. It is not true. We have LEAP. LEAP has over 240,000 beneficiaries. It is one of the well-targeted programs Ghana has ever had. I spent over a, a week or more in the villages assessing LEAP. And they will tell you, it is the computer that selects them. And they believe that those that have been selected are the right people. So if you have 480, 240, we've been able to target. Why can't we scale it up and target uh, SHS uh, students? We can do this. I don't think we should, we should. Another option would be for us to target grade C and D schools and say, look, these schools are free. Because they, are, they don't have the numbers. So if people go there, they are free. Otherwise, if you go to a grade A school, like Achimota and Wesley Girls and whatever, why do you pay Kofi Bento's uh, son's school fees? I'm with him at you know, Why do you pay his fees? I mean, it is, I don't think we should do that. There are other things that he would rather prefer government does for him. Provide ambulance for Kofi Bento when he's ill so that he can be, you know, provide a hospital bed. So I think targeting can be done properly. Uh, the last one, the third option would be to have a scholarship scheme where uh, those who cannot afford uh, means the same scholarship scheme, and, and then, then we can, you know, there are other options that we can, we can discuss. Um, support from parents, I, I, don't, I don't find that, um, and I'll speak from experience, I've been the house PTA chair for Achimota School for, for four or five years. When we went in there, there were several things. We paved the whole compound, we got them a pitch, we got them a generator, we got them a borehole, there was even an e-library that 10 of us bought computers, renovated. You know, parents are willing to support. Then we have Form 1 parents who come in. It's agreed that you pay 300 CDs each Form 1 parent. That's the money we use to support the school. We were providing them with dispenser water because parents were bringing boxes of water. If you go to the house master's uh, lounge, fill with water, fill with fizzy drinks. And we said no. Let's provide dispenser water. Through these levies, we're providing that. 
Later, we were told to write a letter, seek approval. We did. It was turned down. So parents cannot support the free SHS system. We want to help. Government cannot do it alone. It is our country. We just want to help. Prof, so I believe there, Prof, there are things so we can... If, if you make that categorical statement that government cannot do it alone, would you then say that we did not scrutinize or question the policy enough at the beginning, so that when government said, I am taking it on at the beginning of 2017, we should have seen it from the beginning that this, this is not going to work? No, at the beginning, I, I, I never foresaw a situation where government was going to take on everything. I thought PTA was going to do what they were still doing. So for me, later when I realized there were things we couldn't do in the house, that, that, that was a limiting factor. That was a limiting factor. Okay. Uh, I, I want to move on to uh, Mr. Hafar now um, to take your concerns in a few minutes uh, on, on specifically on the policy. Yeah, uh, there's a point that uh, Bentu raised in terms of management of the schools. And uh, it's, it's good to know that you scale those kind of errors. And uh, I went to a school, the same school that the young man went to. But I'll tell you, the best school ever. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. Uh, I was teaching English in the United States. M uh, the people that I was teaching, and also the teachers, about 100 teachers, I was one of the few who were selected for a program called GATE, Gifted and Talented Education. And then it, I had people come to ask me, are you sure you came from Africa to teach us English? But I'll tell you this. They spoke better than I did, but I knew the mechanics. I knew the, I knew the mechanics, Papa. Papa. There's no two ways about it. But then the issue was this, how was I educated? And it's come, it comes to the question that you raise again, management of the schools. Now, this is a perennial problem. It was perennial then, and it's still here. And the issue is this, and again, you know, the work that I do where I train teachers, I'm, I've gone all over the country from Accra all the way to Wa and so on. But then the attitude, Again, it's a Ghanaian problem too. The attitude in terms of how schools are mismanaged, where the concern is, uh, th there's no concern for the well-being of the students. I will tell you this, you know. I'm, I, I keep saying at my age, I turned 71 in April. I can't lie. You know, I have to tell the truth about this, that we don't seem enamored enough with commitment to help our young people. That is the uh, point. I've gone to schools where there are no toilets, and I'll tell you, nobody cares. And nobody cares meaning this. The parents themselves don't care, because the, the issue is this. Here you are, you have a child who's going to school, and you'll be there, or she'll be there from about 8 to 3 p.m. Mm. And p human beings have to attend to nature's call. Where are they going to go? Parents themselves don't care. Now the issue is this, what if it's a girl who's in a period what does she have to do? These are the larger questions that have to be addressed. Now, I'm, I, I went to France, but I also started school in a bush, uh, a place called Tutuka, you know, Boaz. I don't know if some of you guys know it there. It was one room, no toilet. So if you need to ease yourself, you go behind a tree, ease yourself, and you pick the closest leaf and clean yourself with it. And we're smelling all the time. You know, these are the larger issues that society has to be able to grapple with. Now, having said that, who are the people who manage our schools? You know, and you realize that it's someone who's probably taught mathematics and been very good at it for about 10 years, or someone who's taught uh, integrated science, has been good at it, and so on. Things have changed. Mm. We need a caliber of qualified people who can show leadership in terms of managing the schools. And they don't necessarily have to be teachers. Mm. And now come, let me give uh, an example too. You know, we have Reverend Lockhart who was one of the people who produced uh, uh, Francis Battelle's, who produced Kofi Annan and the rest of it. He didn't teach, but he made sure that every teacher was on task. The instructional strategies were together. The pedagogy was together. And that no absenteeism, and then there was no presenteeism. You know what presenteeism is? Yes, sure. The person is there, but they're not going to do their work. So, so, so Reverend Lockhart, in that example, had he, he showed ownership. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's more serious than I've seen, if you have no idea. So, so he showed ownership.